Hello. Okay, everybody, welcome to Wednesday night. Uh, today is the 14th? Yeah, September 14th. And Wednesday night, Karis Bible Studies. Today we're going to continue with Spirit, Soul, and Body. Um, Andrew's been working on this with videos that we're using now for almost three weeks. So it's a pretty depth, in-depth program, and we're on lesson number 10, I believe, in the workbook. So what um, I'm going to do is today is we're going to show Andrew's video, which is about like 15 minutes maybe. And we're going to follow up on some question and answer session and also read through some, uh, go through some of the revelation Andrew talks about with this. And then we're going to as well have a section from the Karis Bible College videos from Arthur Menchez that speaks to the same point in, in a little bit uh, different way and supports it as well. So we're going to go ahead and add that to, to, the, to the last five or nine it's actually nine minutes or so that Arthur's going to speak on the very same topic. So we appreciate you joining us. And just to start off, we're just going to open this up to thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity as well to minister, to hear from you, to let, let all of this be spirit inspired and derived that it may speak your word to the ears, hearts, and minds of the listeners, and so that their understanding can be broadened and deepened. And we pray this always in the mighty name of Jesus. We're looking for revelation, not just knowledge and information, but understanding and revelation. That's our goal for these teachings. All right. Thank you, Jesus. When we pray in your name, amen. amen. Okay. So we're going to start off with, we did this yesterday, and I liked it, so we're going to do it again. Let's just get into the spirits. One of my favorite, one of many. I have a list here. You can go on my YouTube channel and pick up my list of about 41 praise and worship videos. So you'll love it if you get out there. It's a great, it's one of some of my favorite t uh, songs. So without any further ado, I'll step back and let's just get into a moment here if we can. I'm going to start in the middle because I don't have nine minutes. We'll only give it our five. It's a long song. Yeah.
sedikit. Praise God. Yeah. I love that song. There's a verse in this song that I want to see if I can capture it. It just speaks in something to me that I find pretty daring. Seeing this verse and reading it and asking the Spirit to lead me where my trust is without borders. That is like an open-ended place that is, be prepared. <laughs> it's all I have to say. You know, they say, be careful what you ask for. Well, I don't know what you got to go through or what it takes to get to a place where you're led, where your trust in the spirit has no borders. I think I, I, I envision like Enoch being translated yeah. into heaven with his faith. Well, trust and faith is an interchangeable word there, you know? So I'm like, to get there, I mean, it, it, that's just... I mean, you meditate on that for a while, and praise God, you're gonna you're gonna get blessed. I don't think we should have borders where the spirit is concerned. He's yeah, not, no, he's not gonna lead us into something bad. Everything would be good. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, but in this world, and I, you know what? And and maybe that's because this, if you're confined, the spirit leading you in a way where it's um, where it's truly a God-inspired walk where the, like the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, where you have that ordered spiritual movement. That is, that is awesome. Let and, me write uh, that down real quick. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just saying because if you have that, that path that you're going to take, you know, that narrow road that's compressed and that wide road that's death and destruction, if you're just wandering around trying to get to that spirit point where your trust is without borders, I mean, that's what I mean about Enoch. He, he, he had a faith that I'm sure didn't just happen. I mean, to get wow. to that point of faith, and, and you're going to go through some stuff, you know. So, and that's, and that's really epitomizing the human experience to translate your soul and prosper your soul to that level, you know, then that, that, and that's, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's kind of amazing. You'll be blessed. Hallelujah. I think that Enoch had the, the uh, gift of faith because just to walk off the face of the earth with the Lord, I would love it. I would go right this minute. Wouldn't that be awesome just to have the Lord take you? Yeah. But when you think about it, you know, Enoch was special, no doubt about it. Well, I mean, I think it's, and actually we're going to talk about in this teaching in our identity and understanding who we are and believing the truth over the facts, if you will. So 
let's go ahead and start. I think that we're going to get enlightened and we can even probably elaborate on that at close. Okay, so here we go. This is lesson number 10 in the workbook, but it's like, I don't know what number in the teachings. We're in, I guess it's number 11 in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in the playlist, number 11 in the playlist. Okay, so here we Andrew. go. Thank Welcome you, to Andrew. our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm starting my third week of teaching on spirit, soul, and body. And this is just my favorite thing in the world to teach, or I guess in the Lord to teach. I tell you, this has changed my life. I am so excited about it. And I really believe that the people who've been watching this program are being transformed all around the world. You know, I had a number of people come up to me in just the last few days and start trying to tell me how that the programs had changed their life, and they just broke down and started crying. They didn't know how to express it. And, um, you know, and I understand. I know how this has changed my life. It would be impossible for me to just communicate verbally. And a matter of fact, that's what I'm doing. It's, it's frustrating in a sense to try and to tell you what, how powerful this teaching has been in my life and what it's done for me. And I'm saying all these things to encourage you. Those of you who haven't yet got this revelation, that you still are struggling with some of these things we're talking about, I'm encouraging you. It's worth the effort to get these materials, to go back over them and to listen to it, because this is a life-changing teaching. And we now have this brand new study guide, which is a great addition to all of our teaching on spirit, soul, and body. It'll help you. Uh, to get this, and also it was designed primarily to help you teach this to other people, either in a Sunday school setting or in a Bible school setting, and uh, it would be a real blessing to you, so please take advantage of those things. I've been teaching for the last week about how that when you get born again, your spirit completely changes, and according to Ephesians 4.24, it was created in righteousness and true holiness. First John 4, 17, as Jesus is, so are you in this world. First Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, identical in spirit to Jesus. Uh, Galatians chapter four, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. If, uh, Romans 8, 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You have Jesus living inside of you, and your born-again spirit is identical to him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, that your born-again spirit cannot sin. It is holy and pure. And then I started teaching on Thursday of last week that Ephesians 1, 13 says, once you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That that holiness and purity that all of those verses I was quoting talk about, that instant purity that you had when all sins were forgiven, at that exact moment, you were sealed, vacuum-packed with the Holy Spirit. And if you sin as a Christian, that sin penetrates into your physical body and gives Satan against you in the physical realm. It'll penetrate to your soulish realm, into your emotions and into your mind, and it'll cause depression and confusion and anger and all of those kind of things. But it does not break the seal. It can't penetrate the seal of the Holy Spirit around your spirit. And therefore, in the spirit realm, you stay righteous and holy, even though you go out and fail and sin in your physical body. And since God is a spirit, John 4, 24, and he, we must worship him in spirit and in truth, that means that God is able to love you and to fellowship with you and to bless you and to do all of these things, have relationship with God, even though you aren't perfect in your physical body. I don't say that to encourage you to go live in sin, but I say that to those of you who are trying with everything you've got to live for God, and you are just human, and you fall short, and you aren't perfect, which includes every person breathing. You know what? This will break the guilt and condemnation. You'll be able to approach God in spirit and in truth. And I started using last Friday Hebrews chapter 9 and uh, verse 12 and verse 15 where it talks about that through one offering we obtained eternal redemption, which is talking about the forgiveness of your sins. You don't lose 
this right standing with God that we gain through Jesus every time you sin and have to go back and get back into fellowship with God. But in the Spirit, you have eternal redemption. Verse 15, Hebrews 9, 15, you have eternal inheritance. And again, if you were to take all of this in its context, which I don't have time to go back and read all of these verses, but if you were to read the book of Hebrews, it is written to Jewish believers to help them transition from the Hebrew, the Old Testament way of serving God, into the New Testament way. And there's many contrasts between the Old Testament uh, way of approaching God in the New Testament, and one of them is that in the Old Testament, every time a person sinned, there had to be a new sacrifice for sin. There had to be this day of atonement on a yearly basis, and there was just constant animal sacrifices to atone for sin. But in the New Testament, only one sacrifice for sins dealt with you forever. Past, present, and even future sins have been forgiven. That's the point that's being made, and he uses this about five times here in the ninth chapter, contrasting the way it was done under the Old Covenant with the way that it was done under the New Testament. Let me drop down to Hebrews chapter 9, and in verse 23 it says, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, talking about animal sacrifices, blood of animals, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He's saying that the tabernacle and the Old Testament temple were symbolic of things that really existed in heaven. And so they were cleansed and purged symbolically. But the real things, the real temple, the real mercy seat, the real holy of holies that exist in heaven had to be purified with more important things than just the blood of animals. And of course, it was the blood of Jesus that purified them. And in verse 25, it says, uh, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Well, can you see what he's saying right here? He's saying it's not the way it was. In the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices every morning, every night. There was people that brought sacrifices to atone for individual sins. And then there was a day of atonement where they went in once a year and dealt with all of the sins that were unconfessed, all of the sins that they weren't even aware of. You just had this constant flow in the blood constantly, all of the time there was atonements being made. And he says, but it's not like that in the New Testament. He doesn't have to offer himself often as the high priest in the Old Testament did, entering in, you know, with the blood of others. Because then, if that's the way that it was, Jesus would have had to have offered himself often since the foundation of the world. But once, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him that shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Again, if you were to go back and study this in its context, the contrast is just undeniable. In the Old Testament, they had to offer a sacrifice. They had to ask forgiveness every time they sinned. In the New Testament, one sacrifice for sins for all time sanctified us and put us into right standing with God. That is just some kind of powerful. And then in chapter 10, remember that men are the ones that broke this letter into chapter and verse divisions for the purpose of reference. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not a new thought. It's continuing on. It's the very next sentence. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? As a proof that these Old Testament sacrifices never made anything perfect, they kept offering them. If it would have perfected the people, they'd have quit offering them. That's what he's saying. Well, the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't make anything perfect, so they had to keep being offered. But now we have a New Testament sacrifice of Jesus. 
Jesus paid for all of our sins. Past, present, and even future sins are paid for. And because of it, one sacrifice for all sins, for all times, has forever perfected us. Sin has been obliterated. God is not dealing with you based on your sins. This does not mean that you're free to go live in sin. Because it, first of all, if you're truly born again, you want to be free from sin, not free to go live in sin. And secondly, if you go live in sin, you are opening up a door to the devil and Satan's going to eat your lunch and pop the bag. You don't want to do that. But God has dealt with all of your sin. So in verse 2 again, he says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. You know that we have been once purged through Jesus. That's the context of all of this. And we should not be sin conscious. Our life and our relationship with God should not revolve around sin. And yet this was true with me one time, and I bet you it's true with a lot of you watching this program. That every time I came to God, it was all about, oh, God, I come before you so humbly. God, I'm just so sorry. I know I'm not the person that I should be. I know I've done this wrong. And then you'd start mentioning all this stuff. And you would just spend a huge amount of time talking about how sinful you were and asking God for forgiveness and telling him you're sorry. And, oh, God, help me to live better. This says that there should not even be any more conscience of sin. Boy, that's radical. That's radical. And not very many people understand this. Matter of fact, it scares a lot of people. They think if I wasn't conscious of sin, if I didn't go around bearing this mentality that I'm unworthy and just feeling like I'm just the scum of the earth, and if I wasn't upset with myself and constantly monitoring and holding myself in check, I'd just go out and live like the devil. You know, it's really just the opposite. If you've been born again, the spirit that's within you, 1 John 3, 9, cannot sin. It doesn't desire to sin. It's dead to sin, Romans chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. And if you would focus on that and relate to God and just instead of thinking about all of your sins, think about what he's done and think about how good he is and think about all of the great things that he's done for you. You know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think I'm an old sinner saved by grace, well, then you believe at your core being that you're a sinner and you'll only resist temporarily or partially. And after a while, you'll give in because after all, that's who you really believe you are. But if you believe you've been born again and if you become a new person and if you're focused on that, you know what? You'll wind up beginning to talk and act like a new person and you'll start getting set free from these actions of sins and you'll wind up living holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before through not having sin consciousness. That's absolutely true. You know, that's a whole nother message, but that, that's a powerful truth. And this is saying that if there could have been a sacrifice which would have really forgiven sins, then they would have ceased to be offered because the worshipers would have had no more sin consciousness. Well, Jesus is a sacrifice who did deal with sins, and because of that, we should have no more sin consciousness. That's wonderful. Just imagine what it would be like to enter into the presence of God and just go to worshiping Him for how holy He is, how good He is, how good He's been to you, what He's done for you, and just worship Him without any mention of how sorry you are. Amen. <laughs> Some of you can't even imagine that. You've never done it. But that's what it should be. I heard Kenneth Copeland one time, he says, if you feel like a gnat on the back of an elephant when you approach God, then instead of talking about how small you are, talk about how big he is in comparison to you. In other words, if you feel like you haven't done everything right, instead of focusing on all of your sin and your failures and talking about that, talk about how wonderful God is to provide this salvation that he can forgive you and and set you free from all sin, past, present, and even future sin. And praise Him for how good He is. Talk about the wonderful goodness of God instead of your sorriness. Hmm. Boy, that's powerful. You know, for time's sake, I'm going to skip a number of these verses. They all fit perfectly. 
And it's just reinforcing this same thing that Jesus has paid for all of your sins. You shouldn't have any more sin consciousness. But let's drop down to verse 10. This is Hebrews 10.10. 10. He says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now here again, the reason I'm using these verses is to show that we have eternal redemption. Hebrews 9.12. You don't lose your right standing with God every time you sin. When you were born again, you were created righteous and truly holy and then sealed with the Holy Spirit. And God, that sin that you commit after you're born again doesn't penetrate that spirit. Therefore, God is able to look at you in your spirit and you're always righteous and holy and pure once you've been born again. God is not imputing sin unto you. He's not holding it against you. And so this verse says that by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, some people have said, well, that means once for all people, but not once for all time. You have to go back and every time you sin, get that sin under the blood and get reestablished in your relationship with God. If you read this in context, it's going to show you that it's talking about once for all time, not once for all people. So again, let's read this. Hebrews 10.10, 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, See, the context shows you it's not just one sacrifice for all people, but no, it was one sacrifice for all people forever, talking about length of time, that you don't have to go back and re get, get saved over and over again, born again, again, again. You don't lose your right standing and then have to get back into right standing. When you got born again, you were given a spirit that was righteous and holy and pure. It was instantly sealed with the Holy Spirit, and it retains that one sacrifice dealt with all of your sin for all time. That is just some kind of powerful. In verse 12, he sat down on the right hand of God, verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Boy, that's powerful. By one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Who's sanctified? Verse 10 of this same chapter, just a few sentences prior to this says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Jesus sacrificed sanctified you. The word sanctified means to make holy or to set apart. And verse 14 says, if you have been sanctified, you have also been perfected forever. Now here again, see, is where you understand spirit, soul, and body. The scripture says this, that you've been sanctified, perfected, eternal redemption, eternal inheritance. People go to the mirror and they say, this is sanctified. This is perfect. And they see all kinds of imperfections. They see things that they don't like. And they say, how can this be perfect? The Bible is so hard to understand. But it's not your body that was perfected. And you could not, you know, stand in front of a mirror and tell that your body's not perfected yet. You could search your emotions and your thinking and say, well, I'm not perfect there yet. I still, I know I'm not walking in the joy and in the victory and in the peace that I'm supposed to. But it's not talking about your body and soul. Over here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 and 23. Again, this is the same book. It was divided into chapters and verses to help us reference these things, but it's not a different thought. It's the exact same book. He just keeps saying this over and over and over. And over in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, it says, But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, in the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Right there, it tells you which part of you was sanctified and perfected forever. It's your spirit that has been made perfect. Your physical body isn't perfect. It's got to be changed. The scripture says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that this mortal 
must put on immortality, and this corruptible must put on incorruption. There is a terrestrial body, talking about an earthly body, and there is a heavenly body. We haven't got a heavenly body yet. This is still my physical earth suit that I'm walking around in. It has been purchased, and I am promised that someday I'm going to get a glorified body that will be able to zip from place to place. <laughs> it will be able to go through walls as Jesus glorified body was. It won't have the same limitations that this physical body has, but I don't have that glorified body yet. I've still got a physical body. I've been promised that I'm going to know all things as even also I'm known out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but right now my mind is still partial. I only know in part. I only prophesy in part. So my body and my soul aren't perfect yet, but in my spirit it has been sanctified and perfected forever. Amen. Man, I don't know if that helps you, but that, that would put a shout in a statue. That would make a corpse shout. <laughs> and that's powerful. <laughs> powerful. God has changed me in my spirit. I'm identical to the way that I'm going to be throughout all eternity. You know, so many people sing, when we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. And it is going to be a great day because your body and your soul will finally catch up with your spirit. But right now, your spirit is as complete right now as it will ever be. And as much as you can renew your mind and change the way you think and quit dealing with things as a mere human being, if you could understand that you've been born again and in the spirit realm, you are identical to Jesus. You are sanctified and perfected forever. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit so that whatever failure or sin you do doesn't penetrate that seal and it doesn't corrupt or contaminate or take away any of the good that is in you in Christ. If you could understand that, man, I tell you what, this just would motivate you. If you really believe that you had this on the inside of you, and again, most people don't because they can't see it in a mirror and they can't feel it with their one of their five senses. So if they can't see it, taste it, hear it, smell it, or feel it, most people don't believe it exists. But it does exist. This is what the Word is saying. And if you by faith could perceive this, it would change your whole outlook. You would quit dealing with things as a mere human being. You would start expecting God's supernatural results. You would start walking in healing and health and prosperity and joy and peace. It would just transform your life. I'm telling you that this is what's happened to me. This teaching is what has changed my life. And there's a million things that I've learned since then but this is kind of like the key that started all of these things, that opened up all of these doors. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is what you need. You need to understand what's happened to you in the Spirit, that you have been sanctified and perfected in your Spirit. And that Holy Spirit has been sealed so that no impurity is ever going to change that. It doesn't lose its potency. You don't lose your right standing with God. Boy, God loves you because God sees you as you really are. God sees you better than you see yourself. You look on the outside, 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looks on the outside, outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God is seeing you in the spirit. And if you've been truly born again, you are a new creature. You are absolutely sanctified and perfected forever. You have eternal redemption and eternal inheritance. And God sees you differently than you see yourself. You need to start agreeing with God. This is I really encourage you to get these materials. Amen. Amen. Well, that was, um, I would say it was, uh, it's pretty much just showing a hundred different ways to say the same thing when when he's trying to explain to you your identity and how God sees you and how the guilt free life um, or the guilt free or the actually, you know what? I'm going to go right to the scripture. He used Hebrews 10, 11 and 10, 10 and a bunch of others in Hebrews. And he was going through all those scriptures to explain to us about how one sacrifice did all this work that Jesus brought us to a new place. 
and actually, if you took a look at it and in other scriptures, it talks about what one man, Adam, did and destroyed. One man, Jesus, came and restored and much more. It's almost like what he's trying to tell you is the truth about yourself, your identity, realizing that as a result of the finished work of the cross, your identity if you just knew yourself by the spirit and only the spirit, which is sealed, protected, can't sin, impossible to sin, perfectly, whatever, you would think differently. You would think differently of yourself and all of those thoughts that you had about yourself that are now different would result in different behaviors. You, you wouldn't want to sin. Sin would have no dominion in your life. You would have a completely um, different opinion of things and, and your reactions would be different. Everything would change about you. And really what would change mostly is what your life looks like. Because what your life looks like now is a result of the way you think about yourself and everything that you believe. That's what you have. So if you began to change what you think, you would have other things. You would have healing. You would have all the things, the promises of God. You would have all those things upon you. So this um, guilt consciousness or this, there should be no, this whole thing of a guilt conscience or, or sin consciousness, as he puts it, needs to be a paradigm shift you need to just shake it out of your head and hebrews 10 22 i like this scripture because it says it describes the conscience in this way it says let us draw near with the true heart okay the jesus heart the truth in full assurance of faith jesus faith not our faith jesus faith that he did this it's finished having our hearts our hearts sprinkled from not just a conscience an evil conscience a sin consciousness guilt condemnation and shame is evil our bodies washed with pure water you see this is evil conscience and the idea and how an evil conscience affects our lives is just, or sin conscious, whatever you want to say about your conscience, how it affects our lives, however you want to describe your conscience, is, is it multiplies things. It, it gets magnified. Your soul, essentially, your, your opinion of this, your, your, your mind, your understanding of these things, magnifies everything in other words whatever you focus your soul onto gets magnified and turns into a reality the idea of and he talked about this also thinking about higher truths thinking about things like god in a in a and when you're when you come to god like a flea on an elephant don't talk about your fleeness Talk about the greatness of God, that huge thing. I, I, I understood Sid consciousness one way too, like, like a dog. If you've had a dog that's been whipped or beaten or jammed, when you come home, I like my dog who comes to me happy and joyful and, and, and just, and, and that's how I want to be able to approach God. I don't want to approach God like a dog that's been beaten, like I'm not sure, you know, what master I'm going to get today. And I'm cowering with my tail between my legs in the corner to see if it's okay to come out and give you a lick. I mean, sometimes that's the way we approach God because we just think like, holy Lord, you know, you have all this guilt, shame, and you're begging, oh, forgive me. And be the happy puppy. Hello? You know, he's your daddy. He's your, he's your owner. He's your master. He's your father. This is where you're going to be a happy puppy. 
So now some people, and I've had arguments with people or discussions, whatever you want to call them, debates about consciousness of sin. They, they want to pick words about it, say, well, you shouldn't have consciousness of the sin noun, meaning your identity housed in sin, but you should most definitely have consciousness of your sin actions, verb, when you do something wrong. That should really weigh on your conscience and repent from that and turn. If you start mixing your consciousness to, it says your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. It's funny because if you're sprinkling something, I mean, I'm a cook, I cook a little bit. And when I sprinkle, you know, some salt on something, I want to make sure it gets all around it. And, 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 and even it's called dusting. If you're baking, you, you want to roll that thing in there. You want to get it all over it. That's what it's talking about, sprinkling it all over. It doesn't say, well, keep this side for your sin verb. You know, don't sprinkle that side. That side should stay raw because you should know about your sin. That's not what God's relationship with you or your relationship with God, what Jesus died to provide for you. It's nothing, to, it's nothing like that. If you have that interpretation, again, you're not free or free indeed because now you think that there's a prim pro quo about your relationship with God. And there's not. He's trying to tell you there is not. That's why he repeated it a million times. One sacrifice for all, forever, past, present. It's talking about in its entirety what God sees. His, your glory his opinion of you is what that means. What he thinks about you, how he looks at you. He doesn't look at you any different between a sin verb or a sin noun. It, and, and Andrew explained it. He doesn't even see it. So to drive this home, it's a quarter to eight. I don't want to lose too much time, but I do want to share with you a perspective on this very same understanding or revelation, but from a different teacher. This is Arthur Menchez, and he's going to talk about it for about 10, 15 minutes, so we may go over 8 o'clock now, but I want you to get a, a, a glimpse from another point of view. That's a, you know, Andrew touches on this, and he makes a good point about it, but he also talks about your born-again spirit and what you have to do to, to receive this opinion of value from God is to believe on Jesus, and, and I think it actually goes even deeper than that. Not that anything Andrew said was wrong, but Here's another perspective that even takes it to another level. And I'd like for you to hear this because it's going to take everything that Andrew was talking about, which he's very um, articulate in the way he puts things for as to not to, to keep them in a balance, you know? So, but here's someone who kind of swings the pendulum a little bit more to the other side, but I think intentionally and, 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 and justifiably because of what we're dealing with in this world and the way religion and guilt has affected us as a, as a, as a race. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. This is off the mentions, let freedom reign. This is lesson number six. You can catch this on this website uh, as a member. You'll get a password to access these teachings, but it's is lesson number six. And it's called Living Guilt-Free. I'm only going to catch the end here because this is where he starts to speak about this guilt and this understanding of the way God and why and what the finished work of the cross does for our understanding about our opinion of us. Okay, our identity. It's chapter 5. Turn there with me. Very, very. That was 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5. Quickly. Second Corinthians chapter 5. And again, I, I really apologize that I, that I have to go this fast and, and kind of rush with this. But, man, I know that you guys are bright and sharp and you, you can grab this. and Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14. Listen to what uh, Paul writes. He says, for the love of Christ constrains us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all be dead. 
Now, here's the thing. Do, 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 we all do believe that when Jesus died on the cross, that all of humanity died in Christ, right? Come on. Not all believers, all of humanity. See, that's critical. This is a, this is a fundamental slight difference from all believers versus all humanity. The whole idea of the, what the finished work of the cross and what Jesus accomplished. So this Can is get back one more time, Kurt, would you? Yeah, sure. I think I started here. Yeah, I'll just go back. You know, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn there with me very, very quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And again, I, I really apologize that I, that I have to go this fast and, and kind of rush with this, but... Man, I know that you guys are bright and sharp and you, you can grab this and hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Listen to what uh, Paul writes. He says, for the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all be dead. One died for, this is again, talking about that sacrifice. Okay. This mm -hmm. is the sacrifice of that, that Andrew was just talking about, this very same sacrifice. But now listen to the expounding on this particular understanding. That's a slight difference. Not that anyone's righter or wronger. I don't fit anything into a box. It's not my box. It's God and the revelation that works for you. So uh, allow this to just minister to you and you decide. See, one of the things about that, that you know, I've had this discussion with other people about how, Oh, I don't need to go to Andrew Walmack's college because I already know all that stuff. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> you may think you know all that stuff, but I can tell you, the first words out of your mouth saying you know all that stuff, that's like Ichabod. The glory has <laughs> left. There is no way you know all that stuff. And as a matter of fact, these teachers from this Bible college are hand-picked by Andrew. Every single teacher has a perspective that brings to the table something different in a way that's within the glory box that Andrew uses, which is a much bigger box than anyone that I know in the ministry, because most of them are very protective of their little box. So here we go. Now, here's the thing. Do, 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 we all do believe that when Jesus died on the cross, that all of humanity died in Christ, right? Come on. Yes. Not all believers, all of humanity. Because he was not just our example, he was our, come on, substitute redeemer. Amen? So now watch. So if all died in Christ when he died on that cross, so when he was raised from the dead, did he leave some behind? <laughs> Amen. Come on now. All right. So now notice, he says, uh, and that he died for all, that they which live should henceforth live unto the, not live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Okay, now, you know, would you give me some license here to kind of give you my interpretation of that from the original language? This is what he says. He says, it is true that if he died, one died, then all died. And if it then is true that we have died in Christ, he says, now, therefore, you don't have to live as you. You know, live as him. For he's the one who died as you, so that you might live as him. Yeah. Amen. So live as, as him as what? As whatever is true about him is true about me. Come on now. <laughs> All right, so now notice. And then he says, and uh, verse 16, Therefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. See what Paul is saying is, don't you realize? He says, if these things be true, that Jesus did these things, and he did it for all men. He says, therefore now we know no man. Not no Christian, but no man. He says, we don't know any man. You, you don't know me from the flesh. Now, you, you and I, we can only look at the flesh and the outward appearance. But he says, I now know that there's something about you that goes deeper than your, your flesh. 
on your outward appearance. Amen. There is something that is true about you now that maybe even you don't know, but it's still true about you. It says, I don't know any man after the flesh. So that means when we see any man out in the world, no matter how bad they look, you know, I, I, I mean, I hang out with bikers and, and go to biker bars sometimes and hang out, you know, with, and talk to people and so and some bad dudes, you know, they look, but it's amazing that when I go in and I start looking at them and I see them for who Christ has already made them, all of a sudden I have something that I can touch them with that turns some of these mean guys into puppies. Yeah. You know why? Listen, you know, do you know why? Because the only reason he's that mean and looks that way is because he doesn't know who he is. Yeah. Man, I'll tell you something, when I start, I realized that it changed the way I look at the world. Come on now. Okay, so here's the thing though is, I say, but Arthur, we need to look, yeah, okay, but here, first of all, stop looking at yourself from a merely fleshly point of view. More importantly, before you even look at anybody else, don't ever start, don't ever look at yourself anymore from a fleshly point of view. Basically this, give yourself permission to be and have everything Jesus had faith for and died on that cross for, for you. That's the conscience. Take that evil conscience out and give yourself a break. This is where it starts, folks. Anyway. Don't look at yourself from the outward appearance anymore. Don't judge yourself from the outward appearance anymore. Why? What's so important about that? What is so important about that for me is, is that we need to understand that, that, that uh, Christ, listen to Colossians chapter two, uh, 3 and verses 2 to verse 4. It says, and, and set your minds and keep them on that, uh, um, keep them on what is above the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died. And your new real life is hid with Christ in God. <laughs> you know the flea. You're as big as the elephant. You see, this is a parallel to what Andrew was talking about, but it's a different twist. It's just a little bit more in depth on this particular topic or issue. Amazing. <laughs> Jesus help me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, I, I sometimes want to burst behind and say, what's he saying? He says, listen, as far as this world and this life is concerned that we have here, where we fail, where we make mistakes, where we screw up, where we stupid sometimes. He says, according to, he says, according to the gospel, you're, you're dead, man. And your true life is hid with Christ in God. It's hid. It means nothing that goes on here can contaminate that, re contaminate that reality. It's hid with Christ in God. Come on now. Now watch, now watch the next thing that he says. He says, when Christ, who is our life, you don't have to live as yourself anymore. You can live as, as him. For he's the one who died as you so that you could live as him. And Christ is now my life. Everything that is true. So what do you mean Christ is my life? Christ is my life. That means everything that is true about Jesus is now true about me. And I'm going to start living my life as if everything that is true about Jesus is true about me. Hallelujah. I'm going to derive my life and existence from what is true about Jesus. Not what is true about Arthur and, and the Manchester family and where we come from and what we've done and where we've been. Philippians, you know, talks about, it says that the communication of your faith. That's Thylemon, not Philippians. He just read his notes wrong. <laughs> Thylemon 1.6. May become effectual. That word effectual means powerfully energized. That the communication of your faith may become powerfully energized by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. What does it mean? Oh, listen, all of the realities, the gifts, the callings, 
of God are in us in Christ Jesus. And we hinder God's work in our lives if we will go around and not acknowledge that to be the truth. Amen. Wow. Acknowledge it. He said to me, but Arthur, I, I feel so stupid about acknowledging it because my, the evidence of my life just shows that that's not true. No, it's the evidence of your life is the way it is because you are not willing to acknowledge who you really are. See, that's why sin conscious is evil. Regardless, I don't care if it's sin noun, sin verb, you will not break free to this revelation about how you can change your behavior until you get a root that's based on a clean understanding of the truth. Not your reality, not your belief, and not a fact about you, but the truth about you. And when you start to acknowledge, speak it to yourself. Hallelujah. Believe it in your heart. I will give you a guarantee that your life will start to change for the better. Hallelujah. Your life will start to change, not for the good, not for the, to be more moral, but to be more godly, godlike, Christ-like. Come on. And it will be effortless. In fact, you won't even notice. True, I tell you what, true transformation in a Christian's life, the Christian himself rarely notices if it's true change. Now, if it's, if it's change that is exercised by discipline and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it is never change. If you had a, a conscience that wasn't sprinkled completely, and you left that one side of thinking about and trying to change your behavior based on what you know to be right and wrong, it won't be true change. You may get away with it for a while, but it won't be true change that just happens effortless. Because the same effort that you put in to change yourself from the outside is what you're gonna to have to keep on putting forth that effort to keep the change. And you will be constantly aware of how much you've changed. In fact, you're gonna go and be upset when people don't realize that you've changed. And you'll most probably go and in some way say, have you seen it? <laughs> Do you notice I don't cuss that much anymore? <laughs> Yeah, I tell you what, Jesus is doing a great job. No, Jesus is not doing anything for you. You're doing it for yourself. <laughs> See, the, the, the true, a true believer who has his absolute trust in the finished work of Jesus and all that he is just absolutely enamored with is the love that God has for him. And that's what he concentrates on, finishes and sees who he is in Christ, believes that in his heart. He won't even notice that he stopped cussing. Other people will come and say, you know, you haven't been cussing. You say, really? <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. You know, I, 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 I tell people, I say, that, that was one of the first things. My daughter, uh, my eldest daughter, she was about 12 years old. I mean, that she made it to 12 years old with my religious attitudes was, was awesome. But she came to me one day after several years of, of understanding the grace of God and, 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 and just allowing the spirit of God to manifest within me. She jumped on my lap one day and she took my cheeks and pushed them up like that. And she said, daddy, do you know how much you have changed? Now, let me tell you when a 12 year old daughter notices that you've changed, you've changed. <laughs> and as she said that I, my mind went change. I don't think I've changed. And as she said that, I started thinking. I mean, everything about me started changing. Everything. 
That's true change. Hallelujah. Something else. So I hope that blessed you and gave you a good um, dynamic of, of you, if you will, of all of what this teaching means in terms of realizing your identity, realizing from what position we operate now through our spirit, soul, and body revelation of the whole idea of the spirit and how we focus our mind and our soul on that spirit side of things, you know, that will change all of your life. It'll change everything in your flesh will be changed as you focus your spirit, your, your, your soul onto the spirit. This is the idea. This is the two to one majority that Andrew talks about when you take your soul and which is your thinking, your behavior, your mind, your will, your emotions, all of that, and focus that on the truth as opposed to the facts and how it will manifest in your flesh. It'll manifest into true change, as Arthur was just closing out with that. So, again, I just want to thank you all for the time today we had. It's 8.03. I don't like to go too far over. We keep these um, messages to one hour to respect your time, but we do make our website available for 24-7. Here it is once again about us. You can contact me through there. Our Bible studies, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night, everything's available for you to log into. And incidentally, these teachings that are password protected are all available on other teaching links down here on the bottom. There's all kinds of other teachings here. Some are password protected and some are not. There's um, worldview uh, points that we like to understand, some of our affiliate partners and different things. This is a complete 51 hours, or actually it's more like 100 hours. It's a 51 lessons, which is Dan Muller, the School of Kingdom, living it's absolutely great as well this is a huge playlist it's available on the site take a look at it i encourage you we have um giving as part of our discipleship plan for god and what his how to how to stay in right standing or i should say just how to receive you have to give so you want to receive you give god gives seed even money and finances to the sower You'll get that and, and as you give. We give one time, monthly, or to Karis Bible Studies directly. We encourage you to do that at least once a month. And that's the Karis Bible College program. We have video teachings and audio teachings. We'll be perfecting this more and more. Um, it's a little bit slow right now. I probably will do something this weekend to, to, to ramp this up in a, in a fast track pace so that you can have more videos online. The videos go to a separate link, which is actually a membership program. Uh, we are offering a 14-day free trial here, but the memberships are very modest. They're about $4.99 right now, but that's the introductory pricing. We have Karis Bible College teachings that will be made available here. Wendell Parr is an awesome teacher. You'll love his, his manner of uh, teaching as well. He's quite the comedian in a subtle way, so you'll love him. And then also um, we have audio downloads because I have a huge teaching library of Joseph Prince and others that I like, and I'll be sharing those with you as well. This is a Joseph Prince teaching. This is a little bit about it and God's promises and what it means, a resounding yes and amen. So you speak it and you will see it. Hallelujah. That's where your faith is in action. So take a listen to him. He's an awesome teacher and has a great message. We're working on a social network. This is just starting off. Most of our posts and things that I post will come from here into Facebook, into YouTube. It all translates. We're getting all these social networks together on this one platform. So your Twitter account, your Facebook account, your LinkedIn account, your YouTube account, everything will work through this portal and you can share and watch and, and see what other people share all based on a membership for people that are looking to 
uh, have like-minded believers and discussions outside of all the commercial that we see in the other social network platforms. So I encourage you to get involved in that as well. Um, please use the resources 24 seven. This is what this is about. It should be up and running and available anytime you're available. I know we don't get a much attendance on this uh, on a very regular basis because of the cares of the world. We want to make sure they're not choking the word and taking you out. So we're keeping it open so the cares of the world, you can manage your time and use these resources to help you. Okay? And for guest speaking appearances as well, I do those. You've got a teaching series coming up here. If you have a small group or any group whatsoever, I'll be able to attend and actually be live, and I encourage the guest speaking opportunities. It gets me out of the house for one, and I focus everything on this. You can click on this um, from there to eternity and get an excerpt of the first couple of pages of the workbook that I've divined for eight classes. And it goes through and tells you a little bit about what to expect from this series. All right, folks, God bless you. We're just going to close in a quick prayer. We don't need to make them deep. This is a better way to pray because we just speak to the mountain about Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you do. And we speak right now to everyone's mountain, everyone's life, anything you're dealing with. I pray um, corporately right now for any healing, for any need, for any lack, that you will step in and take a, your authority and grab it and take and cast out those things, what you loose and what you bind, and make them work for you on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Jerry. We'll Bye. see you next time. Sure. All right. Thanks a lot. You need anything, give me a shot. You know how to reach me. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Kurt. Good Bye night. Bye-bye.